Hello, and welcome to part 9 in our study on what God is like. We have been looking at the attributes of God. In the last two lessons, we were looking at the wrath of God, and we kind of want to conclude that here in this lesson, and then sum up uh, the entire series. We ended last time showing uh, some of the results that happen, um, because we have rejected God in society, we have removed him from our schools, we've removed prayer, uh, we removed Bibles, and that's gone on into government more and more that God has to be taken out of government. And all in all, we've just less, God is less and less and less involved in society. And then we've shown some of the repercussions of that, some of the natural results. We talked about what you, uh, what we sow, we reap. And part of the thing that I wanted to emphasize, too, is that the wrath of God is still in play, and the wrath of God is not all future, like in the tribulation period and at the final judgments, that the wrath of God can be experienced even right now. And we ended with looking at how if we persist in our sins, individually or as a society, that we can get to the point where God gives us over to our way of thinking. He, the scripture says that he gives them over to a reprobate mind. And the natural result of that is that your life just becomes more and more and more engrossed in sin. More and more evil, deeper and deeper into sin. And it happens in society. That, that you see more and more evil in society, more and more sin going on. Things that start happening that uh, years ago you wouldn't even think that they were possible. And yet they now become almost everyday occurrences. So that's kind of like where we left off. And <clears throat> we want to pick up here to sum it up. Is that when we see the moral fabric of our own lives. Or the moral fabric of society falling deeper and deeper into sin. We need to realize that these are signs of God's judgment. That these are the signs of God's judgment upon us. And that we are reaping what we have sown. And it is time to change. We need to change. We need to repent. And we need to seek God. Uh, to do it as a society, it has to begin with people doing it individually. But we, we cannot survive as a society. We cannot survive as a nation without God. We think we can. Many people think that we can. There's, there's a lot of people that you know, are still in church and still believe in God. Uh, but it's, it's, that number is dwindling. And those that stand against, even those who don't deny God, he's just not really part of their lives. And they're not following what he says to do. I'm amazed at the, at the people that uh, I know that go to church every week. Uh, say they believe in God, some even say that they're Christians, and yet things that are clearly against the Word of God, and things that are clearly that God says, clearly says that are wrong, they don't, not, not only don't condemn them, they praise them. They think that there's nothing wrong with it, it just, oh, isn't that wonderful, or oh, isn't this, or oh, isn't that, and I'm not going to go into all the specifics of it, but I'm like, here's people that claim that they know God and love God and go to church, and yet they're praising and condoning things that God clearly says are wrong in sin. Connect those two dots. We have to recognize this, that, that if we're disagreeing with what God says, we need to change. We need to repent or we are going to lose it. We can lose this society. We can lose this nation. It is not impossible. Listen to some of the founding fathers and presidents. George Washington stated in his farewell address, Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. He's saying it can't. Without religion, you're not going to maintain morality. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality 
can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Whatever else you put your trust in your mind and you think science is great and this is great and that's going to be great, that's what he's saying. With all of that there, reason and experience tell us, should tell us, both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. In essence, remove religious principles, remove God, remove the Bible, remove prayer, and you're not going to maintain national morality. And his words are proving to be true. Theodore Roosevelt, in this world, a churchless community, a community where men have abandoned and scoffed at or ignored their Christian duties, is a community on the rapid downgrade. I think what we just went over, and I scratched the surface, proves him to be 100% correct. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan says, quote, Without God, there is no virtue, because there is no prompting of the conscience. How we talked about the shootings in the schools and the churches and this and that, and we go, what are they thinking? Where is their conscience? How could they possibly even imagine doing these things? Not only do it, but I got, they need to think about it, but they actually do it. Without God, we're products of evolution, no prayer, no God, no Bible, no standard of morality. Let me get back to uh, the wonderful president. Without God, there is no virtue because there is no prompting of the conscience. And without God, democracy will not and cannot endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Let me say that again. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. End quote. These men knew, and, and multitude others I, I, I could read for you. Without God, we're doomed. We're going to experience judgment and wrath. I remember back when the World Trade Center was attacked on 9-11. Two pastors came out pretty quickly, whether the same day or the day after, uh, came out and they stated that they believed that the World Trade Centers and, and uh, being hit, and I forgot the, the place, in Was the Pentagon, the, the Pentagon down in Washington, and they were going after the White House also, that these actions taking place on our soil were a, was God judging America. The two pastors were Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson. And they clearly said that they believed that this, these actions were God's judgment on America. That statement was met with immediate outrage from the public. Immediate outrage. People need to go, you know what? There might be something to this. Maybe we better rethink what in the world we have been doing and what we are doing now. No. Immediate outrage. How in the world can these pastors make such an accusation? How could they possibly think that this was a judgment from God? One, some people were thinking that, how would they think that God would do something like this? Once again, God is love and grace and mercy, and he can't bring judgment. Look at all the times in Israel, with the nation of Israel. When they disobeyed God, when they turned away and they went their own way and did their own thing, the judgments that God brought upon them, he brought other nations against them. He brought other nations that brought destruction to them as a judgment on their rejection of him. And yet we sit back somehow and we think, oh, God can't do that. He can? Yes, he can. He's God. He's sovereign. He's holy and righteous. And if he wants to bring judgment against evil and bring judgment against a people's rejection of him, he can do it. Some people are thinking, oh, no, 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 he won't do that, he can't do it. And others were thinking, well, even if God still did that today, even if it was possible, well, he's certainly not going to do it to America. I mean, America does not deserve God's judgment. And they came out and made those statements, and almost immediately those two pastors re recanted their statements, took it back, said, so, well, you know, I forget their exact words, but they were kind of like, well, maybe we jumped the gun here, maybe it was a little bit. In my opinion, my opinion, when I give you my opinion, I tell you, in my opinion, 
uh, they buckled under the, the pressure of the people. They listened to people. They didn't listen to God. Because when they first said it, I totally agreed with them. God is perfectly capable of doing that, and he would be just to do it. And if you don't think that's so, go back and listen to the series that, we, that we've gone through. And how God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't do things that are wrong. And how God can bring judgment. So once again, you know, many Americans think God just doesn't do that like anymore. And that it, certainly if he did, he wouldn't do it to America. Why? Because we have grown blind to our sin. We have grown blind to our sin, how we have sinned against the holy God. I mean, look how much we've got in society. You can't have a manger over here. You can't sing Christmas songs over here. You can't go to school and call it Christmas anymore. It has to be the winter holiday. We've, in essence, looked at God and said, Take a hike. Buzz off. We don't need you. We don't want you. Oh, the separation of church and state. Stop being a meatball. Stop being a meatball. Don't be so easily deceived. Separation of church and state has absolutely nothing to do with God being out of the government. All that it meant and all that it means is that the government would not establish a state religion. That's what it meant. That's what instituted the whole writings to Thomas Jefferson because somebody thought that the government was going to establish a national religion. And that's what had happened in England and that's what people left for. They didn't want a national religion. And that's what Jefferson was answering. He's saying, no, 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 no. We are not going to establish, the government of the United States of America is not going to establish a national religion. There will be the separation from government to, to religion. It won't establish a national one. But he was not saying God had to be out of government. Religion had to be out of government. And we know it because I started reading with George Washington. He didn't even go through every single president of how this nation in God we trust, how it's founded upon God. Look at the Declaration of Independence. On and on and on you can read. I don't want to do a whole history of that. But absolutely they believe that God had to be there. But we have become blind to how much we have rejected God and how much we have kicked Him out of society. When you can't even say, it was even not a comical thing, but a lighthearted thing when Donald Trump was saying that when I become president, you can say Merry Christmas. Amen. Amen. I don't care what your political views is. Amen. It's Christmas. Christmas. It's not Xmas. It's Christmas. It's a day that we celebrate the birth of Christ. If you don't want to celebrate it, don't celebrate it. Who cares? Don't do it. Don't do it. But that doesn't mean we can't call it Christmas. I have to call it a winter holiday. Or the school children can't call it Christmas. Then if you don't have it, then, then don't have it. Then don't have the holiday. Don't celebrate it. Easter is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't want to celebrate it? Don't celebrate it. But it's not some dumb, dopey rabbit jumping around. I'll oh, get me going. I'll stop. The whole point is, is that we've grown blind to our sin. We've grown blind to our rejection of God. We've grown, grown blind to what rejecting God and His standards has caused us. And we are reaping what we have, or have sown. We are experiencing a degree of God's judgment for our defiance and rejection of Him and His standards. And we're not recognizing it. We have to recognize it. If we do not repent, then we will continue to reap what we have sown. We will continue to experience God's judgment. It will only get worse and worse and worse. Absolutely. That is completely, totally biblical. Now, the good news is, after all of that, the good news is, is that God's judgment and wrath can be removed. It can be. Nationally. Probably most listening know this verse, but, let, but certainly let me give it to you. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Revival is possible. Repentance is possible. God will listen. But we need to come to Him. We can't keep scoffing at Him and telling Him, take a hike, get lost. We don't need you. 
So as a nation, nationally, society, we can do that. And God says, I'll heal your land. Personally, it can be done. And it really has to start personally. John 3, 16 through 18, we've, we've quoted that how many times through this series? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Romans 5, 8 through 11, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And we talked about this, I have a lot more verses here, but we've talked about it in, 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 the, in the other lessons of how Jesus Christ went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. And if we trust in him and accept him as our Lord and Savior, not, you know, just believe. Believe doesn't, when it says, when the Bible says believe in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean intellectually acknowledge that Jesus Christ exists. The demons do that. They know that Christ is real. They know he's the Son of God. They acknowledge that he exists, but they're not saved. One, salvation's not open to them. But when the Bible uses the word believe, it actually means trust. Trust in Christ as your Savior. Not just intellectually acknowledge a fact. Trust in him. Repent of your sins and trust in Him. The hope for sinners is that between us and the wrath of God stands the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to repeat all of that uh, into here because I did, in the, in the last two lessons, talk about that a lot. So we talk about the wrath of God, how horrible it is, and how it's, it's going to get worse. And there's day coming when God's going to... The, he says, the cup of my indignation is full. And I'm going to pour my wrath out on this world. And we are going to see God's judgment on this planet like it's never been seen before. That's the tribulation period. If you go home, to be, if you go home and die before uh, the tribulation period comes, then you're going to stand in front of God. If you know Christ is your Savior, you will not experience the wrath of God. Because Christ has taken it for you. If you don't, if you have not trusted Christ as your Savior, then you will experience the judgment and the wrath of God for your sin. That's why I said there's hope for sinners. There is hope for sinners that we can be delivered from the wrath of God, and that's through Jesus Christ. I've said it numerous times, and let me just say it again. God's love is there through Jesus Christ. There's the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. The forgiveness of God. It is seen through Jesus Christ that he offers the gift of salvation. The holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the justice of God is seen in his wrath and judgment of sin. So, if you get to the point where you experience the wrath of God, don't blame God. Don't be surprised and don't blame God. It's your fault. It is your fault. Because one, you are a sinner. We're all born sinners. But God provided a way for you to escape it. If you reject it, if you say, I don't need it, I don't want it, I don't believe it, it's not real. Darcy Taylor, you're just, you're, you're just full of baloney. I don't want to hear it, I don't want to know it. You can say it. That's your choice. God allows you to make that choice. But it's your choice. And you will reap the consequences. Realize it's your choice. You make it willingly. So when you stand before God, you can never say, I didn't know. I'm sorry. After death is the judgment. Or how can you, you can't blame God. Because God's going to say, I provided a way for you to escape. You chose not to take it. Now, when we talk about the attributes of God, the holiness of God, the judgment, the wrath of God, how should that affect the Christian living his life today? Let me just give you a couple verses. How should God's wrath against sin, knowing God's hatred for sin, 
How should that affect us as Christians? Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That doesn't mean you have to be trembling and afraid of God, but it's saying as you're being sanctified, as your salvation is working itself out in your life. Remember we talked about progressive sanctification, how we become more and more like Christ each day. God is saying doing that with the fear is having a reverence for me, a respect for me. Don't become, never become flippant about sin. Always do it with, with, with fear and trembling, saying, you know, God is a holy God and he expects me to be holy. God, help me to live for you. Help me to be holy. 1 Peter 1, 13-19. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, be obedient not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's what God has called us to. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to live holy lives. Now, let's take all of this and, and, and put it together. <clears throat> what have we seen? We've seen that God is a personal God. That was number one, the first attribute. That, that God is a person. In other words, we can have a relationship with Him. He has a mind. He has intellect. He has a will. He has intelligence. He has emotions. And we put that in contrast that some people believe that God is just a force. He's just an energy. He's not someone that you can talk to or someone you can have a relationship. No, God has a personality. Second, we said that God is simplistic. And that, without re-preaching the whole thing, we, we just emphasize that God is not made up of parts. All of his attributes are equal, they are constant, they are continual, they all are part of making up who God actually is. Attributes do not get added to God, attributes do not get taken away from God. They are the same all the time. Thirdly, we said God is self-sufficient. He needs nothing from anyone outside of himself. He can supply all of his needs, all in his own power and might. God is immutable. That means he's unchangeable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So all the things that we look at, all the attributes that we discuss, all the things that we're talking about, they're all equally a part of God forever and ever. The love of God does not overshadow the wrath of God. The wrath of God has not been taken away because God now has more love and more grace. They're all there. God is not changeable. He's the same at all the time. So that we can trust in Him. We can have confidence because we know that God is the same. He's not moody. He doesn't get up today and go, I don't think I'm going to be this. I'm going to. We can have confidence in God every single day. The omnis, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere with us. He knows where we're at. He knows what we're doing. That should bring great, uh, it, it should be a warning to us that we can't hide our sin from him, but should also bring confidence and peace because we know that God is there. We're never alone. We may not have other people around us, but we're never alone. God is with us. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He has all power. He can do whatever he has determined to do. Whatever he's called you to do, he can give you the power to do it. And he has more than sufficient power. Whatever he wants to do in your life, he can do it. He has the power to do it. And no one is stronger than him. The world's not going to overthrow him. Satan's not going to overthrow him. Demons aren't going to overthrow him. God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows all the facts. He knows all the details. He knows past, present, and future. He knows what's going on. He's not lost. He's not an old man sitting in the rocking chair, as we said. He's not getting feeble in his mind. He knows what's happening. He's on top of everything. He's got it. He's got all knowledge. He knows where you are. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. That's God. He's got it all. Add to that knowledge that God has is the wisdom. God not only has all knowledge, he knows how to properly use it. He knows the best way to employ that knowledge. God doesn't make mistakes. You don't have to look at him and say, God, do you, do you really know what you're doing now? I mean, kind of like, was this the best way to do it? Yes. 
That's the answer. Yes. Yes. Because God knows all the options, He knows all the ways, and He knows the best way to do it. And He's setting a course for your life. He loves you, and He knows the best thing for your life. Trust in the omniscience of God. Trust in the wisdom of God. Then we said God is sovereign, the sovereignty of God. He is the absolute ruler. God is completely in charge of the whole entire world and everything in it. He has not lost control. He knows what he's doing. He knows when he's going to do it, how he's going to do it, why he's going to do it, and it's going to happen. If God has determined that it's going to happen, it's going to happen. His omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence will all make sure that it happens. God is in control. This world has not gotten so bad that God's sitting up in heaven wringing his hands. Uh-uh. God knows exactly where he's at. Everything is on course. God knows what's happening. Ten we looked at, God is holy. That's really, I mean, everything, everything gets wrapped up in the holiness of God. He is awesome and above and beyond us, beyond that we can measure, that, that, we, can, that we can even think about, that we can even, th that's the separation from God in his essence, in his being. God is God. We are not. Don't paint God in our image. And all it will do is bring God down. Okay? God is absolutely holy. He's completely separated in his essence. He's that magnificent and awesome and majestic. And he is completely separated from any kind of evil or immorality or sin. We talked about God's righteousness. We didn't do a lesson specifically on that. But we talked about how God is righteous and just. And then we talked about because of God's holiness, and because God is righteous, and because God is just, God is also a God of wrath. A holy, righteous, just God must judge evil and sin. And we just broke down in three lessons uh, why, why the wrath of God is real, why it's in play today, and why it's going to be play, in play in the future. And how the love of God does not overshadow it or cancel out the wrath of God. It's all part of the holiness of God. And then I was going to do a, a specific lesson on the love of God. But I, I think we have, I don't want to say, can I say a good grasp of that? But we've kind of filtered that all through each one of the uh, lessons that we've had. So there you have the summation of what we've done. I took it from 14, I think, down to 9. Uh, I felt that was a good thing based on, on things that I said during each lesson. But let me just close with, I, I think we can see by looking at these things, that our God is an awesome God. And again, let me repeat this. I originally started with 20. I put it to 14 in my notes and actually spoke on 12, filtering the other. There's more than that. We have not exhausted, I have not exhausted the attributes of God. I encourage you to get into the Word of God and study, study, study. There is so much more. That this little feeble mouth and mind has not exhausted these things. I hope I've helped you with it and to have a, a clearer picture of what God is like. But there is much, much, much more to learn. Listen to Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. For God says, here's the awesomeness of God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The holiness of God. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. It means, remember we defined that, you can't number it. You can't put a number to it. It's just absolutely um, unsearchable. That's the it's it's so big and immense. It's unsearchable. Psalm 147 verse 5. Great is our Lord, and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. It has no limits. It has no limits. Psalm 8 verses 3 or 4. We haven't used this verse much, but just think about it. Because when you think about God, you think about us. Psalm 8 3 and 4. When I look at the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, 
and the Son of Man that you should care for him. When we see how awesome God is, we talked about creation and how creation reveals God, and you see this awesome magnificence. In humble hearts, we've got to sit back and go, God, how is it you even think about us? How is it we even enter into your mind when we think that you existed perfectly in eternity past before you even created us and you got along just fine? What is man? We've sinned against you. We've rebelled against you. We've gone our own way. We've done our own thing. You are, we are so weak and we're feeble. Sometimes we can be pig-headed and stubborn. And you are so awesome and magnificent. What is it that you, that you are so mindful of us? That's the love of God. That's the mercy of God. That's the compassion of God. That's the graciousness of God. God is gracious. We didn't touch on that one. That God would be mindful of, not only mindful that he would think about us, like, hey, well, yeah, yeah there, there's that creation. Oh, yeah, I remember that. He loves us. The scripture says the very hairs on our head are numbered. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God, because it matters to God what happens to you. What a magnificent God that it matters to him what happens to us. Not only did he think about us, he cares about us. And he cared about us enough to provide salvation for us so that we could spend eternity with him and not have to spend eternity in hell. So that we didn't have to be separated from him. When I consider all these things, God, and all your attributes, what is man that you are mindful of him? Last verse, Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God. Amen? Amen. I hope this series uh, has helped you to understand God a bit more, to see Him a bit more clearly. I hope it's helped you to draw closer to Him you are closer to the Lord. I hope it has had helped you and will help you to praise God more, to exalt God more, to worship Him more, to love Him more. To love Him more for how He has loved us. God loved us not because we first loved Him, but He first loved us. And I hope that when you see this in the awesomeness of God that you love Him more, that you trust Him more. That you more easily put your life in His hands. And when you're going through the difficulties of life circumstances, knowing God's love for you and His compassion for you and His holiness, how He cannot forsake you, how He will keep His words, when you think of His omniscience and His omnipotence, all of the power that He has and all that He's able to do, that you're able to trust Him more, no matter what the situation might be, and that you're able to thank Him more. God, what is it that you're mindful of us? Thank you for you. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the precious gift of salvation. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the things that I know, and Lord, for the things I'm not even aware of. Thank you. We thank you and praise you. And all of this should push us and motivate us more to serve God more. Lord, you're not there simply to serve me. How can I serve you? I am your child, your servant. What is it you would have me to do? Let me serve you in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you. Because that shows thanksgiving. That shows appreciation. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I hope that you listened to the whole series. I hope that this was a blessing to you. I said in the beginning that my goal is one, to bring glory and praise and honor to God and to help strengthen uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ and to bring out the gospel message. It's a wonderful, loving God that's out there. Thank you for watching. May the Lord richly, richly bless you.